Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the study this evening. Here it's uh, still a couple hours to Sabbath, but happy Sabbath uh, to all who are participating in these studies. And um, we're going to be looking at um, uh, you know, eventually the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. We're not going to start there. Uh, we're going to look at some scriptures. And then we're going to look at some history. Um, but before we begin, can we open with a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath that's coming, for the fellowship that we can have with you and with each other. We're thankful for the trials of the week. We're even thankful, Lord. Uh, for your for our failures that we see in our lives, that we have a dependence upon you. And we need your Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, to teach us. I pray that you can guide this study and that it can be helpful and practical to each person who watches these videos. And um, we just pray, Lord, that um, you can teach us the meekness and lowliness of Christ. Be with us now in our fellowship with one another and in our conversation and on this Sabbath that it can be a blessing to each one. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening again. Now, we spent a lot of time going through the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. And we learned quite a bit and there's still much that, that we have to learn much. We have to unlearn. Now I promised last time that uh, we would look at the history leading up to 1895 and it's rather complex. So one of the problems I have with history is um, it sort of isn't much different than gossip. That is, if somebody were to write, you know, a history of my life, um, I mean, they can make me look pretty bad. I mean, they could go talk to people I know, people who don't like me. Uh, they could take, uh, select certain facts uh, from my life. Sounds and, like the media. <laughs> yeah, they can paint you in quite a bad light. And yeah, the media does that all the time. The media is... No, really not different than gossip. But they usually take it out of context. Well, and, and who can really know another person anyway? I mean, even people sometimes that we're intimately associated with who know us almost inside and out, we would think, can turn against us and have a very negative view of us and forget all of the good things about us, right? Not that we are good, but you know what I mean. We, we all have parts of our character that are definitely unrefined, to put it lightly. I mean, we're sinners. We live in a world of sin. We have all done evil. We have said things that have hurt others. Um, we have participated in acts that we are ashamed of. Um, we have hold attitudes about our brothers and sisters in Christ that are unjust as well. And so, you know, if somebody judges us unjustly, it, in a sense, it's not unjust because we judge others unjustly. We're just getting what we give, so to speak. And um, so when you look at somebody like A.T. Jones, I mean, he's fraught with failure, with faults. And uh, it's easy to... Uh, to look at somebody's life, especially when you don't know him personally, he's not here to defend himself. And you can see all the bad things that he did. You can see the aspects of his character that you want to see. Now, back in uh, 1988, I read a book called From 1888 to Apostasy by George R. Knight. And um, I had read lots of Jones and Wagner by that time. Um, and, and what I saw that, uh, George Knight was doing was really the very thing that Ellen White said that we should not do. That is, he was basically just gossiping. He's basically uh, airing out 
Jones's dirty laundry, so to speak. And he was doing this as a way to discredit what Jones taught. And this is what Ellen White warned Jones of, that there was aspects of his character, of his mannerisms, of how he dealt with people that gave a discredit to what he was saying. Not that what he was saying was not true, but there was aspects of his character that made him open uh, to criticism. You know, and I look at my own life and I can see the same thing. I can see uh, many things I've done and said in biblical discussions, in dealing with people who, who differed with me in some way, that I've treated them unfairly and um, misrepresented their words. You know, so those things, you know, which I'm ashamed of. And, and I've hurt the cause of truth by that. You know, and I've, I've done this even in within this movement, you know, in studies where uh, I spoke harshly um, when I shouldn't have. I should have been more patient. And the damage, you know, so when I look at the damage that, that I did, that I caused, I know I can't undo it. I can't change the past. Um, but, you know, the damage is done. You know, no matter how much I change or how much I learn from an experience, if somebody wants to hold something against me, they can. And we've all experienced this. So what's happened to me is no different than anything that's happened to you or anything that you have done. Um, you know, we're we're all human beings. And and so when it comes to righteousness by faith, um, we're just going to look at a, a few scriptures that I think are important. Um, and then we're going to look a little bit at the history um, of what was happening with A.T. Jones. Now, you know, we're all called to be watchmen and we're all familiar with Habakkuk chapter two. And um, William was asking me a little bit about, you know, the mistake on the 1843 chart. Now, when we read this verse, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Now, we know that Elder Jeff had placed this as um, when I am uh, basically argued with. Um, and, and, and of course, that's, that's probably true, but um, it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, the idea here um, uh, is, okay, what does it mean to be a watchman? What does a watchman do? I'll try to keep you guys engaged so you don't fall asleep. What does a watchman do? Well, if he's, if he's on a tile, he's watching for enemies to... It's coming in to attack. Okay, so that's what we normally think of as a watchman. But here, what is this watchman supposed to watch for? Well, what the Lord will say. Now, what, what God's going to say. Yeah. Right? And And who's the one doing the reproving then? What shall I answer when I am reproved? It'll be God doing reproving. Yeah. Yeah. Now we now so I mean there's different ways, and I'm not saying that this is the right or the wrong way to look at this. I mean we could say uh, this is the enemy, you know, that is reproving him, right? So we could say, well, the watchman is watching for the enemy, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Now, I think that's probably how Jeff took it. Right? Thanks, Bill. Sounds familiar. And, and this could be just, I mean, because I look at this verse really talking much more about the internal life than anything. Right? I mean, we can look at a watchman set upon a tower, watching for his sins, watching to see 
you know, his, his correction, whether we're accused by, by Luke, the, the accuser of the brethren, you know, how would we answer him? But also, how will we answer God? So, you know, we often just don't look at this verse in this way. But uh, so I'm not sure particularly um, whether it is God or the accuser of the brethren that's reproving us. But we do need to have an answer in either case. Right. And so the answer here is Habakkuk 2.2. 2. So you had a comment there, Jeff? Uh, no. Uh -uh. Okay. I have a comment, Theodore. I, I'm thinking of uh, Proverbs 8.34, it, where it says, Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. Okay, yeah. Well, and that's talking about wisdom. Right, so Proverbs 8 is the personification of wisdom. Um, I, I actually did this as a, a dramatic dramatic speech when I took public speaking. I recited Proverbs 8. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so it has some significance to me personally. But yeah, blessed is the man that heareth me watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. So we could say that this watching here is... Um, Watching for God, God to work. And we know about watching and waiting, right? That that is the work that we are to do. You know, we're not to set a date for Christ's second coming. We can't know that time, but we can watch and wait. Now, to some people, watching and waiting is just like, well, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. Um, but we know that watching is an active thing that we are doing. Brother Theodore. Yeah. Can I, it's uh, um, Isaiah 21, it's, it's the verse they put right up underneath uh, Habakkuk 2, 1. And it says, 21, 8, it says, And he cried, A lion, my Lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward holy whole nights yeah now if you look at this um isaiah 21 it's going to be dealing with uh fallen fallen is babylon which is kind of interesting i mean that's the title for the um for the section uh the burden of a desert of the sea as whirlwinds in the south pass through so it cometh from the desert from a terrible land a grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media. All the sign thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me, as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted fearlessly. Uh, or fearfulness affrighted me, and the night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels, and he hearkened diligently with must he, much heed, and he cried, A lion, my lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. So, I mean, then it's going to say in verse 9, And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. So, I mean, there's a lot here, lots of symbolism. Um, it's going to talk about the archers in verse 17. Um, 
you know, so this is definitely talking about the end time events. But a lot that's happening here, too, is internal within uh, the person. And, and, and one of the things that I really think that, that often we have problems with in this movement as Seventh-day Adventists, when it comes to end time events, we really look at the external events and neglect the internal events. So what do I mean by that? We know that in order for us to pass the Sunday law test, we have to have a Christ-like character. But we focus upon what's going to happen in the world, thinking that that prepares us for those events. But what, what is going to prepare us for the Sunday law to pass that test? Knowing what mm -hmm. happens will that help us? Because that's all. Well, knowing knowing is a lesser lesser degree. I mean, but that yeah. of itself, of itself, ain't going to do any good. Just knowing it. Yeah. Because we're not we're not our knowledge of of what's going to happen is not being tested. Our character is being tested. And so the each day these are developing our characters. You know for time and for eternity. So those are the things that are the most needful. Now, understanding what's going to happen is important because it does relate to our character. <coughs> it, is, it helps us in making choices, right choices. But it's not the end, knowing the end of things. It's knowing as we walk through events in our lives, understanding the significance of them, in the context of the great controversy. So the answer, Habakkuk 2.2, 2, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. So the way that I take this is this watchman, Habakkuk, he's, he's watching to see what God will say unto him. And he's going to take this and write this vision, make it plain upon tables. He, he may run that readeth this expression having to do with him that's studying it, like running to and fro, that's to study. The Millerites are watching, watching. Mm -hmm. When they made the charts. Yeah. Now, we, now we know the vision here is Chazon, right? That it's, it's the vision of the 2520. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, how do you figure? How do you figure it's a twenty-five twenty and the twenty-three hundred days? Um, well, the twenty-three hundred days is the Mara. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah, that's right. So yeah, this is you're right. So, yeah, and and of course we know that Paul quotes this. Right, he quotes this passage. In uh, Hebrews, yeah, I like to see that. Where does he quote it? I always forget. I'm so bad at this. Um, he quotes it here. Let's do this. Go back to where we were. Um. The, you know, the um, yeah, he was that yeah, verse two, verse two says, um, Isaiah 8 1, and it's um, it says, Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning, and I ain't gonna even try to pronounce it. Uh, Maher Shalar Hashbaz. Maher Shal Hashbaz, yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so anyway, that 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 uh, great role in in Hebrew is a mirror. What so verse is this? What verse is this Paul saying this? That's right I, that oh the one well just he's talking about Isaiah eight. Oh, okay. Eight verse one. 
So that's going to be um, Isaiah, you know, right. He's supposed to write on a mirror. So he's just comparing that right. The vision make it plain upon tables. But here in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, Paul says, for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Right. So he's quoting Habakkuk chapter two. Um, right. Because he's going to deal with this tarrying time. Though it tarry, wait for it. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. So, so this vision that's for an appointed time, you know, Paul, Paul understands the context of this. He's not just choosing some words that sound good. I mean, he understands the scriptures. <clears throat> and so he knows that Christ will come. And he will not tarry. Right? Though he tarry, wait for it, right? Because he that come, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And we see this then in um, <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 37 and 38. For yet a little while he shall come, will come, and will not tarry. All right? So he's, he's quoting it. Now the just shall live by faith. So he's he's not quoting all of it, um, but he's quoting some of it. Now, when it comes to faith, then, what's that? Jeff, did you say something? No, I was just talking to myself. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so... So when we look at, at, at Paul, when we read Paul in Hebrews, we're going to think about the internal part of this. You know, we're going to think about, you know, our characters. We need to have patience. We need to trust in God's promise. We need to have confidence. Right. So, so Paul is talking about all these things, and, and he's talking about what's happening internally but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul so when we look at habakkuk chapter two and we we think about this um you know we're, we're thinking about these prophecies now we know that those prophecies were fulfilled in millerite history that this is fulfilled in mr right millerite history when uh, they made the 1843 chart. And the Millerites understood that when, th when they made the chart, they didn't see the tarrying time. They just, they made the chart knowing that they were taking this, write the vision, make it plain up on tables. So they felt that that's what we need to do. But they, they ignored the tarrying time aspect of it. And then after they recognized the mistake on the chart, then they understood the aspect of the tarrying time. So they were actively involved in this process of watching and waiting. So if they weren't watching, if they weren't studying scripture, if they weren't looking at what God wanted to show them, then, and, and they hadn't written the vision make, making it plain upon tables, uh, they wouldn't have been able to experience what God wanted them to experience, that the just shall live by faith. And of course, we have done the same thing in this movement. We have studied the scriptures. We have um, put the vision on, on tables, right? We've analyzed the prophecies of the past. And God has brought us through an experience that is watching and waiting. And we've made mistakes, just as the Millerites did, because there's a mistake on the chart. God held his hand over the mistake in the figures, right? And, and the same thing has happened in our history. So, so we make mistakes, but what God is looking for is our response. Are we wanting Christ to return? And are we learning the lessons that we need to learn? And one of the things I see with Jones, so I'm tying this to A.T. Jones, is he teaches righteousness by faith. But if I'm going to look at a fault that Jones had, 
I mean, I know he had, you know, he's a little bit controlling and he was, you know, harsh and all these different characteristics that other people bring out. But the real problem was he wanted to see Christ return. And yet he saw the truth being trampled upon and he made the mistake of taking it personally and not trusting that God's purposes were being worked out. And that's something we always have to be very cautious about because just because we know something to be true or we believe it to be true. um, We also need to have faith. We need to have patience Patience with with our brethren, right? Because God is doing a work of reproving us. He's correcting us. A lot of us were affected with July 18th in that way, too. Mm -hmm. Some other ways. Yeah, and and the thing about the July 18th date, you know, I mean, we saw that if we're repeating Millerite history, I mean... The prediction, there has to be a disappointment there. And of course, we were clearly shown well in advance that July 18 was going to be a failed prediction, uh, but we didn't heed it, right? So it's on a line of failed predictions. And and so we should have we should have listened to God. But of course, we also saw that the chronology was correct. So Why did God allow us to go through that experience? One is we were unfit um, for the work that was before us. I mean, that's pretty clear. And we can see that in the aftermath within this movement, how people have acted, how we have acted. So we know that we were unfit. So, um, when we look at the history, we look at the past, we look at A.T. Jones, because we're going to see some ugly things when we start to go through this history of, of the church, this part of the rejection, the proclamation of righteousness by faith, the third angel's message, and the rejection of it, and how it leads to the present situation in the church. And we need to learn the lesson from it. I mean, we need to understand that we can't make the same mistakes that those in the past made. I mean, for me personally, because I've been so involved in studying Jones and Wagner's books and and presenting sermons on righteousness by faith for the last 40 years. um, You know, in some ways, you know, I took that message personally. It's, It's something I was very close to. And but I also tried to learn from the mistakes of Jones. So I'd read the counsels that Ellen White made to A.T. Jones. And I'd read what Jones wrote himself that he didn't follow. And, you know, I've had to guard myself that I'm not going to. I'm not going to get caught up in the controversy. Because I've seen people fall. I've seen people presenting the truth on righteousness by faith. And as soon as they're opposed, um, they take it personally and they're out of the church. And then they start going off into different errors. And and the one thing that we have to learn is when, when we present truth, what we believe to be truth, We have to trust that God is the one that can defend it and that God sees all things and that we can never take it personally. An attack made against us is not attack against us if we're presenting the truth, but is an attack against the truth and God can defend the truth. But you know, as humans, we take it personally. We feel that like somebody's attacked us. And often they do. I mean, they, in order to attack the truth, what they will do is attack the man. They'll question our character. They'll misrepresent our words. Um, 
And, and so, I mean, they're trying to get us to take it personally so that we can discredit what it is we're, we're professing to believe. Because Satan has that advantage. Because he can lie. He can misrepresent. As a Christian, if we enter in onto that ground, we're just doing Satan's work even if we're prevent, professing to believe the truth, even if we do believe the truth, even if we present true things, if it's done in a wrong spirit, uh, it's the work of Satan. If it's attacking a person, if it's seeking to justify self, it's destructive. <clears throat> well, Jesus himself has overcame that attacks you know yeah well yeah you learn learn from christ how christ dealt with it now what i'm going to do here is i'm going to look at an article from the sda encyclopedia of seventh day adventists right it's uh, encyclopedia of seventh day adventists and um this is the article on jones now of course you have this this article written by a person and this person, of course, is going to have an opinion, right? Um, and they're going to use facts, right? Because they're, they're not going to lie. Uh, but they're going to choose their facts based upon their, their belief system, right? And we're all going to do that. So, you know, we're not going to say, oh, you know, they're lying about when he was born. He was born April 26th, 1850. You know, I mean, they're going to give us facts, they don't know much about his childhood. On November 2nd, 1870, at the age of 20, Jones enlists as a private in the United States Army and left Ohio to serve in the Southwest. Um, you know, so it's going to talk about where he served, um, and then it's going to talk a bit about his conversion, right? So he was in Washington. Um, uh Joseph Bates pitched his 60-foot tent in Walla Walla in the spring of 1874. So Jones is going to hear this message. He's going to uh, become an Adventist, and he's going to continue his studying. He's going to become a minister. Um, so, so he had a lot of natural ability, right? And, of course, you know, at the beginning there, he's going to have sort of a honeymoon with the church, right? The church is going to be. You know, somebody becomes an Adventist, you join the church, and, you know, everybody's going to be nice to you, right? Um, they're only going to say good things about you, hopefully, if you're a nice guy. Um, but they're not going to pick at your flaws, even though you have some obvious ones, right? Um, and, of course, our estimations of ourselves change, right? He's going to become an Adventist. He's, he's not going to be somebody who's... Um, sure of himself in the sense that, you know, he knows everything because, you know, he knows he doesn't know everything. But as time goes on, he's going to start to change, right? And that can happen to any one of us. So uh, I'm not going to read over the, this part, but um, they make a lot of about this. This is the Ten Horns controversy. So in... Um, the 1884 General Conference, there was some articles that were uh, written regarding the Ten of Horns. Jones is going to have a debate basically with Uriah Smith that's going to come to a head during the 1888 General Conference. And some pe people make this all about the Ten Horns controversy. Um, it definitely showed some of the aspects of Jones' character in the way that he uh, debated uh, this issue. So, um, you know, he didn't do things to win people over. He wasn't patient. He just tried to correct Uriah Smith, of course, who's been around longer than him. And that's going to ruffle a few feathers. So he's going to start getting some uh, negative, negative press, so to speak. Um, and then, of course, we know the issue of righteousness by faith. 
So it says around the same time that Jones was challenging the traditional position on the ten horns of Daniel 7, a far more significant theological subject would soon add to the tension, tensions between Jones and the General Conference leaders, represented by Uriah Smith and G.I. Butler, president of the General Conference. Along with his colleague E.J. Wagner, Jones had embarked on an in-depth study of righteousness by faith at that time, at a time when, as Ellen White put it, many had lost sight of Jesus and had settled for a lifeless religious experience. Now, when you, when you take some of these statements, because I've read a number of books on this history of the 1888 General Conference. Uh, the first book I read was actually uh, not particularly about 1888, but where I read about it was... Um, uh, the book by um, Leroy Froome, I'm trying to think of the title of it. It's his book on the history of Adventism. Can't think of the title at the moment. Um, Movement of Destiny, that's the title. And uh, at the time, I'd been in Adventist just a couple of years. And... Um, so I, I think I just bought the book used, or maybe I even just borrowed it from the church library. But I happened to have a copy of E.J. Wagner's book, Christ Our Righteousness. And I read what Froome said about Wagner's book. And it's as if he was reading a completely different book than I was reading. So he misrepresented the book especially what he was saying regarding uh, Christ. And so I was very puzzled about it at that time. But one thing I could see is that, that um, Froome was uh, very loose with his quotations and his sources. And it was pretty easy to see that he, he liked to misrepresent uh, his sources. And so that's when I first kind of got this cautious... Um, attitude about reading books about other people. So, um, so when I started studying this, I just began to read everything I could, all the original sources, and I stopped reading books pretty much regarding uh, Adventist history. I just tried to read what Ellen White said about things. And um, until I read 1888 to Apostasy, so that would have been about... Uh, five years later uh, that I read uh, that book. But I was pretty cautious about books, but I, I had to read the 1888 to apostasy because I was so into Jones, I wanted to know what people thought. Um, so anyway, we have this, uh, well, let's read what they say about what this, Controversy. So controversy over Jones and Wagner's emphasis. Um, on the subject of the gospel began with Wagner's teachings that the law in Galatians, which Paul refers to as our school master to bring us unto Christ, was the Ten Commandments. Before 1856, this was the position held by prominent Adventist leaders such as Jane Andrews, Joseph Bates and James White. But in reaction to Protestants who were using Paul's statements in Galatians to undermine the importance of the Ten Commandments, it became standard among denominational, the denominations evangelists and writers over the next three decades to interpret the schoolmaster to mean the ceremonial and not the moral law. Now, again, this is kind of a, it's not really a misrepresentation, it's just incomplete. So one is, we know that uh, E.J. Wagner's dad had taught that the law in Galatians was the, the moral law, the Ten Commandments. But it's, it's not really quite clear that Jones and Wagner were excluding um, the ceremonial law in their understanding of this. Um, the main point that they were trying to make is that Christ was under the condemnation of the moral law. That is, he was born that way in taking upon himself human nature. So if you actually read what Jones and Wagner say and you read the controversy, it's almost as if the people who write about that history 
just ignore what the real issues are because it doesn't serve their purposes in taking their position. And so we always have to be cautious that we don't do that ourselves because it's very easy to do. If we're in a controversy, we can't, we can't neglect to understand another person's position and misrepresent it to others just so that our view appears to be the more accurate. We have to lay everything open before God and before each other and allow people to make their decisions based upon what is written in the scriptures, what, what the facts are, not just because we can present a good argument. We're not lawyers presenting in a court trying to convince, right? And because and who is a lawyer trying to convince? Well, the jury, of course. Yeah, the jury. But who are we to convince? Are we to convince the one that we are in opposition to? Yeah, it would make better sense. Yeah, we want to help our brother to understand something. So if we misrepresent his position to win in the court of public opinion, that our view is correct. And we haven't won over our brother because we've misrepresented what he said. Well, we're not on the side of God. So we have to be really clear that when we're, we're, we're helping people make a choice because you know we want, we want to, them to see the facts. We want to see, here's what this person's arguments are. Here's the strength of their arguments. Here's where I see the problem lies. But if I misrepresent it, then I haven't actually presented the truth at all. Even if my position happens to be on the side of truth, I have not done something that Christ would have done. So, so in this issue, it's not really about the Ten Commandments or the Law in Galatians. It's about the nature of Christ. Was Christ born under the condemnation of the law? Did he experience the condemnation of the law his whole lifetime? That is, did he see himself as a sinner by taking upon himself human nature? So when you just make the argument about some surface issue, then it's easy just to say, oh, well, Ellen White says both, you know, it's both. And so, you know, Jones and Wagner were just off track. And, and that's not really quite the whole story. One is Ellen White endorses Jones and Wagner's message and goes about, um, you know, uh, with Jones and, and uh, Prescott um, and Wagner, you know, presenting these me the message of righteousness by faith. She saw that the God had given them light. It doesn't mean that, that they were prophets and everything they said was correct and that we have to hang on their every word. Um, but we need to understand the message they presented. They might be wrong in some of the details here or there, but it's truth. And it, it was present truth. It was what the church needed at that time. Now, what we're going to see as we start going through these general conference bulletins is 1893 is pretty powerful and 1895 is as well. But there's still this, this underlying animosity that exists. And when you go through Joan's history, um, you're going to see that what ends up happening is this becomes the reason for rejecting it. So, of course, we have 1888. I'm skipping a lot of stuff here. Um, you know, and at the, in 1888, it's interesting that there were 27,000 Seventh-day Adventists in 1888. They had 500 attendees, roughly, uh, 96 of those being delegates. Right. So... Um, so they had, first had the Ministerial Institute, and then they had the General Conference itself. Um, 
It's going to conclude on November 4th, 1888. So we, we've dealt with the chronology of that, of that conference and how it relates to the message at the present time. Um, and then Jones is going to get obviously involved in religious li liberty because he's going to be um, uh, be basically the one defending uh, the Sabbath and the Sunday laws. Um, let me see here. What were some other things? So it's going to talk here about uh, the World's Columbia Exposition, the Chicago World's Fair that began in May of 1893. Um, so that's going to be the 1893 uh, mess, uh, sermons that we read. Um, and he's going to argue against them being a Christian nation, the United States being a Christian nation. Uh, he's going to deal with um, <clears throat> uh, the image of the beast because we read all this. in Revelation 13 was already put in place by Congress, adopting unconstitutional measures. Um, and then also... Uh, that, that they are in the time of the loud cry. Of course, he's going to talk about Revelation 18, the mighty angel coming down in Revelation 18. So he believes that that's where they are at the time of the Sunday law. But Jones is going to be on the general conference um, delegate. He's going to end up, you know, all kinds of positions. And then it says for three years following 1888 general conference, Jones, along with Wagner, traveled with Alan White on preaching tours, which I mentioned throughout the nation to present the message of righteousness by faith. Um, in Massachusetts, Joe, Jones preaching, as Ellen White put it, was delivering soul nourishing food, so much so that even ministers saw the gospel in a light that they had not known. In Illinois, the people received an education in faith as they had never had before, as they learned that it was true religion to depend entirely upon Christ's righteousness, and not upon works of merit. Ellen White was so impressed with Jones' ministry that she declared that to deny him access to the people would amount to robbing the churches of the beautiful message he was sharing. Thinking of Jones' evangelistic potential, she pleaded, let the outsiders understand that we preach the gospel as well as the law, and they will feast upon these truths, and many will take their stand for the truth. And then, of course, it's one of the attractions of Jones' message. Um, when, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I wanted to overcome sin. I mean, one of the reasons I became an Adventist and wasn't a regular Christian is I wasn't interested in getting saved. I was interested in changing, right? I wanted a change in character. I could see my sins. I didn't want to continue sinning. And Adventism provided, um, um, you know, belief in the Ten Commandments and, and that there is a standard of righteousness that we have to live by. But I was already studying, you know, Galatians and Romans uh, long before I became an Adventist. So one of the first things I did after getting baptized is I wrote a paper um, quoting mainly from Galatians and Romans and uh, printed it out and uh, gave it to the elders and the pastor of the church that I was at. And, um, and it was well received. I mean, they... They, they thought it was, you know, for this young uh, 20 years old, I was at the time to, you know, to, to write the, this new convert, to write this. They thought it was pretty good. Um, I did read it later. I mean, obviously, I wasn't a great writer at that point, but uh, not a, not, nor am I still today. But it was much better writer than I was then. But it was quite amazing sort of what I saw just from studying the scriptures without knowing about all of these controversies within Adventism. So, you know, God can teach us from the scriptures individually, but often what we end up doing in Adventism is we depend largely upon the politics of theology to make our decisions about what we believe. And, and that's a serious problem. So, um, now, they bring up the Anna Rice situation. So, I mean, obviously, they have to bring it up. It's part of Jones' history. Uh, but it is, it is quite interesting, the story, because Jones is going to present this woman's writings and say, you know, she has the prophetic gift. 
And after he does this sermon, he's going to go to the post office, pick up his mail, and there's a letter from Ellen White from Australia describing the very sermon that he preached and explaining why what he's what he is believing is error. And um, that corrected him right away. I mean, obviously, <laughs> Ellen White saw this in vision, this sermon in vision before he gave it. But um, she said that based upon this whole thing, she had more confidence in um, not just Jones, but others that, that they could become better men. So I have more confidence in them today than I had had have had in the past. Now, Jones, of course, is going to serve all these different offices. Um, now, where we get into the issue, once Jones starts taking over uh, the Review and Herald um, at a time when it's not doing very well, and he uh, increases its subscription, but they're going to print, present some of Jones' flaws here. Uh, they say here in this article, but Jones' zeal for much-needed reform in the church led him to express his convictions in an insensitive and confrontational manner. Leaders became concerned that his argumentative style jeopardized his influence within the church and could potentially discredit the church's image in the world. Now, I'm reading into this. When leaders became concerned that his argumentative style jeopardized his influence within the church, do you read with me here that they don't like Jones and that they use as, as an attack upon Jones, they show it as a concern? Yes. Yeah. This is really common, right? So it's no doubt Jones obviously get some letters from Ellen White saying, you know, here, this is one, and we're going to look at this. The influence of your teaching would be tenfold greater if you were careful of your words. Be careful that you do not make the word offensive. So they're going to take this quote from Ellen White. And we're going to look at it. <clears throat> so let's go there. Um, so one is you really need to get the context here. So... I just find it frustrating myself um, seeing how people deal with the truth. <clears throat> so this letter was written in 1889. It's letter 91, 1889, or 1899, pardon me. Um, she says, dear brother, as I've read the little pamphlet in regard to the investigation of the review and Herald publishing work, I've determined not to demand or receive any compensation for losses sustained through a wrong course of action in regard to royalties. So this is written in a letter where is there's this investigation regarding the royalties that people were to receive for books that they had written, right? And that this controversy here is uh, something that Satan has brought in to create conflict within the church. So she says, my brother, I beg you not to let A.T. Jones manifest himself in coming forward to receive that which you suppose to be your right and your due. So she uses his name there, right? Don't let yourself manifest. Um, because we can be treated unjustly, right? All of us. Can. And so this whole issue, and for some reason, that's wrong. Okay. Um, uh, for some, you know, this issue arises, and, and a lot of it's not true. That is, um, Ellen White uh, says that, that people believe that they have suffered wrong, but they haven't. But, but this issue came up. And so uh, she says, um, Nothing has been revealed to me showing that you have in any way suffered wrong in regard to the royalty on books. I've seen that some others have been dealt with justly, have not been dealt with justly, but I have no recollection of seeing your case in this connection. There is a need of constant watchfulness on your part, my brother. Be careful lest in de dealing with the mistakes of others that have been reproved, you make a mistake yourself 
in being sharp and hard, critical and exacting. Um, now, one of the things we saw in this movement, and this is not, not to be critical, but we it's, it's to be discerning about what happened in this movement. We know that Satan came in and created conflicts, misunderstandings, and we allowed those misunderstandings to give us views and opinions about others, to cut them off, and that this, this spirit has to change, right? So this, this is something that God is reproving this movement for. And, and Jeff got caught up in it, not to criticize Jeff because he was overworked and, and he trusted people he shouldn't have trusted as sources of information, and he made mistakes. So he's a human being. But this happened in this movement. What happened in the past? It happens again. So <clears throat> she's going to talk about um, some other stuff here. But um, she says, do not press your brethren into hard places. Everything is gained and nothing lost by courtesy. Be kind. Speak patiently and gracefully represent Christ there in brackets. Last night after I retired to rest, I could not sleep. I was in trouble of mind. There was presented before me a number of writers who were zealous to press this matter of royalty. I saw confusion. Claims were urged by those who had not been in the least wronged, but has, but has received just payment according to the value of their writings. And books have been... Uh, Books have been boomed in the papers when they did not possess the excellence attributed to them. Boomed would mean uh, published. Um, one book was published when another, just preceding it on the same subject, had not sufficient time to be brought before the people. The second book was drawing the attention from the sale of the first. The rules of right and righteousness are disregarded for selfish, ambitious purposes. The rights of brethren are to be respected. There should not be a multiplication of books when it must be well understood that one will interfere with the sale of the one just preceding it. And she's going to talk about Bible readings, Great Controversy, Daniel and Revelation, these important books that need to be circulated. Um, she says, Brother Jones, if it had not been checked, this matter of pressing claims for back royalties would have led to a most disastrous state of things. I saw hands reached out to make claims when they had no claim but that which is born of selfishness. I've seen the root of selfishness springing up and flourishing. I was so grieved in spirit that Elder Corliss and yourself should have any part in this work. I beg you both to consider carefully the effect of your demands. Let not self wax to greater proportions, lest the whole man be defiled. One leak will sink a ship, and one flaw break a chain. So there may be some hereditary and cultivated traits of character, that will work in the heart and develop into words that will make an impression for evil, which will never be effaced. We are all building for eternity. Let the character have the impress of the divine in pure, noble utterances, in upright deeds. Then the whole universe of heaven will behold and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let selfishness with its poisonous roots strike into the heart. And what a change is made. The building grows, but it is not symmetrical. The great grand structure may be going up for time and for eternity. That building must stand the final inspection. Is the foundation sure? Is it built upon the doing of the word of God? The word of God warns everyone, take heed how ye build. Make sure that the foundation is laid on the solid rock. The mental powers need cultivation. Our minds are either the workshop of God or of Satan. We are making history, and we want in every respect to practice that which we teach others to do. We need to cultivate every God-given faculty that the character may grow into a beautiful building for the Lord. The mind God gives, the character man forms after the similitude of God or of Satan. We whom the Lord has blessed with great light and great truth need to be circumspect in all things. We are doing a work that day by day is inscribed on the record books of heaven. Therefore, let us who are of the day be sober and watch unto prayer. 
We must have order, harmony, and consistency that we may reveal a working power for time and for eternity. If we are not constantly climbing upward, heavenward, we are descending the rounds of the ladder, earthward. My brother Jones, you need the subduing influence of the Spirit of God. You have hereditary traits of character that are constantly striving for the supremacy. Character is power. It is an influence which makes friends. Worked by the Holy Spirit's power, self will die. But all the preaching a man may do will not make character. It is essential that the foundation cornerstone be laid right. Aright. All your phases of character are to be guarded. Brother Jones, be careful in your words. You know the truth. And I urge you for Christ's sake to practice the truth. You need the converting power of God every day. May the Lord help you, my brother, or he has greatly blessed you. You need the spirit of meekness and gentleness, of patience and forbearance, and of love for your brethren. Take heed how you build, for the structure will be tested. The influence of your teaching would be tenfold greater if you were careful with your words. So that's going to be the part they quote. Right. Uh, the precious talent of speech must never be misused. It is a savor of life unto life or of death unto death. Life and character stand upon great, solid, permanent principles. Do not, when referring to the testimonies, feel it is your duty to drive them home. In reading the testimonies, be sure not to mix your filling of words, for it is impossible for the hear hearers to tell what is the word of the Lord to them and what are your words. Be careful that you do not make the words of the Lord offensive. There are methods that are always right when worked by the Holy Spirit. There are wrong methods, quick, severe speech, words not the best adapted to win and heal the wounded soul are of self. The natural habits need to be cleansed away. The precious must be separated from the vile. <clears throat> Yeah, so there's a bit more here, but it's going to be the same type of thing that she's saying here. She's giving very good counsel to all of us. And all of us need this counsel. Because all of us have experienced this type of aspect to our character in some way or another. Maybe not all of us. There's some people who never speak a harsh word. But you know what I mean. We can sometimes... Um, believe that we are defending the truth but we don't let the truth defend itself and and so we have to be careful about our words very good counsel but here ellen white is not condemning at jones but people are going to take what she says here and use it to question basically what he's taught and um the way that the the church looks at it is that Jones went to extremes, right? So um, there is this issue within Adventism. So this is, I'm going to show you here, a Wikipedia article. Um, now, I don't know when they created this term, last generation theology, but this is um, a term that the first time I heard it was actually from a pastor. It was on... Uh, December 31st, uh, 2017, um, and I was at a wedding, and he, uh, you know, was a good friend of mine for, for years, and he said that last generation theology is the main uh, enemy to the truth in Adventism. So he used to be, you know, a solid conservative, but now he believes that last generation theology is this great error that is destroying Adventism, and that, that that's where the battle is in Adventism against this false teaching. Now, of course, when you take a, a term like last generation theology, LGT, and and you, you sort of subscribe or, in, or conscribe, you know, what that teaching entails— and then you can just throw people into that basket, right? And um, instead of looking at what people are actually saying, right? So you can just group people together in this sort of 
Um, and everybody with the same brush. Yeah. So, you know, just by association, you can just say, well, that person's teaching last generation theology. And now you don't have to examine anything that he says, because obviously last generation theology is error. And, and you can have it misrepresented. You can find somebody who's teaching some kind of error that you can label them as last generation theology. And then you can just associate anybody who is also teaching certain aspects of what that person is teaching. You can just group them all together conveniently so that you can dismiss them, right? This, I don't like the idea of labeling what somebody believes in this sort of neat little package that you can just dispense with. Now, this article, of course, Wikipedia is um, uh, written by lots of different people, um, and it's edited constantly. It can change. Um, but it says here some claim, uh, well, well, let's look at what they say last generation theology is, or final generation theology, is a religious belief regarding moral perfection achieved by sanctified people in the last generation before the second coming of Christ. Although no longer a part of official Seventh-day Adventist theology, some hold that there will be an end time remnant of believers who are faithful to God, which will be manifest shortly prior to the second coming of Jesus, as suggested by the 144,000 saints described in the book of Revelation of the New Testament. Right. So, I mean, here, just the words that are chosen. I mean, what and, and there's a, a place later where they talk about um, the well, I'll find it. I should have probably marked it. Um, but they're taking truth and mixing it in in a language that's misleading. Now, when it comes to perfection, moral perfection, moral perfection is only found in Christ, correct? Amen. And, and the perfection that's seen in the final generation is not the perfection of man, but it's Christ character. Right? Now, is Christ character perfectly reproduced in them through the Holy Spirit, as it's going to say later? But what people are going to get the impression is the type of, they reach a state of perfection. So here's the statement. Last generation theology builds on this belief, that is the belief that, that um, when we're sealed, we're holy and righteous, sanctified, it's progressive sanctification uh, of Christian believers to overcome sin like Christ and to achieve a state of perfection. Is that what we would believe, that we achieve a state of perfection? Uh, no. <laughs> because what's I mean a yeah. Um, you know, I'm the chief sinner, you know, it's <laughs> that that's that's the motivating factor, isn't it? I mean that Christ's character could be reproduced, that his glory can be seen upon us. Does it mean we achieved a state of perfection? Yeah, I, I don't see that statement. What you just said I see as being true. What what the counter is, I don't I don't I just can't see it. Right. So, yeah, because I mean, and of course, it depends what you mean by perfection. But I mean, perfection can mean different things. But we know that this is about a Christian character, a Christ like character that is in the most trying circumstances. When Christ says, let him that is righteous be righteous still, it's going to be his righteousness that's seen upon the believer because the believer is not trusting in his own righteousness. He's trusting in Christ's righteousness, right? He's yes, not. The way I see it. He's not going to see himself as perfect. He's not going to believe that he's achieved a state of perfection, right? It says this is a key teaching of those who adhere to historic Adventism, right? With quotation marks, right? So they're going to. So it, it, I mean, it's. It's just not a fair representation of somebody's position. So, I mean, it's definitely not what Jones taught. 
based on what we read in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. Now, it's true that they're going to be sealed. Christ's character is going to be produced. He's seen upon his people. It's going to be reproduced in us. But this isn't because we're, we reached a state of perfection. It's because we received, if anything, we've just achieved a state of dependence upon God. That we don't trust in self. So somebody reading this, you know, a Christian uh, reading this, they would say, oh, man, there's a bunch of deluded, self-righteous people, you know, who believe they're perfect or going to be perfect soon, you know. And, of course, we see this type of thinking in Adventism. I mean, there are people who are looking for this type of thing that don't understand righteousness by faith. But, but that's, that's the, this controversy that exists within Adventism, right, that exists within this movement, that has existed at least since 1888, if not before, um, that Adventism has to address. It's not going to be settled by reading the books of men. It's not going to be settled by reading any book other than God's word and obeying God and following God and trusting in God. But we also need to recognize when we read Jones that, that self, just like any person, self can get in the way. And the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, I, I think, is the most powerful book I've ever read, Jones, Jones' presentations. They just at least hit me in the most powerful way. But I also recognized that the Jones, that self was even beginning then to rise with Jones because of the opposition. And we should be able to see this when we read uh, the General Conference bulletins. So, and Ellen White is counseling him all through this, this aspects of his character. And, and when, when people are pushed, as Jones was going to be pushed, your natural character is going to display itself, right? When yeah. you're... You're going to see your your character manifest, right? And and that happened to Jones. And we're going to look at um, not not right away, but we're going to get to because this document that we've been reading through is Jones General Conference Bulletin sermons, right? But it doesn't include 1909, and that we're going to read as well. When we get to 1909. You'll see um, how how much Jones had become bitter by what had happened to him. Right? And we're not going to go through all of the General Conference sermons, but we are going to go through the 1895 General Conference uh, Bulletin sermons of Jones because they're so powerful and, and they're going to be addressing... Um, Again, the third angel's message. So it, it's really a kind of a continuation of his 1893 General Conference Bulletin Sermons. Now, um, there is another statement that I wanted to read in the Spirit of Prophecy. Now, uh, this is another letter written to A.T. Jones. And we could have read, read lots of them. There's lots of letters like this. But one thing you'll see in these letters is that Ellen White is not attacking Jones. She's trying to encourage him, to help him, to keep him on track. And, and often when we see a fault in a brother, what are we supposed to do?
go to him, counsel him, discuss mm -hmm. with him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and preferably in private. Now, some people say, well, somebody manifested something at a meeting in a Zoom meeting. And so it's public. And so I need to reprove him at that moment uh, and reprove him in public and, and basically tear down his character because of how he acted or what he said. And of course, that's not the case. Now, there are public sins that need to be um, reproved publicly. But when we have, when we see a brother overtaken with a fault, and they have some kind of aspect of their character that needs to be refined, we see that they're, they're not uh, as effective in how they are presenting truth that we can go to them and talk to them and encourage them. And that's what Ellen White is doing with Jones. Now, this dictatorial spirit that I have there, they, they quote this in this article. Uh, um, we had there from the... So, um, so this, I'm just going to flip over to here first before we read this letter from Ellen White. Yeah. During this time, so this time here is going to be from 1901 to 1903, when Jones served as the president of the California Conference where he directed his efforts to reform the educational and medical institutions. His eagerness for improve improvements made him too intense and difficult for some to work with. And that is probably what Jones was doing was the right thing, but he was doing it in the wrong way because he was creating um, conflicts. that were needless. Now, you could, you could also blame the people who are having problems with Jones, right? I mean, they can, you know, he's rubbing them the wrong way. So Jones has a responsibility too, but often it's, you know, it's not just Jones' fault, right? But anyway, during this time, Ellen White encouraged him to be patient and tender in his leadership position and pleaded with him to renounce his aggressive and dictatorial spirit. Right. And then they're going to go into how Jones got into what they call radical individualism, which in, resulted in classes with the, clashes with the church's organizational leaders. And we're going to deal with that later. But this dictatorial spirit where they have it uh, being quoted is um, in this letter here. Um, which I was showing you. Oops. So I'll flip back here. So she says, now this letter is um, June 30th, 1901. So it's when he's president of the California Conference. I attended a meeting of the conference after you spoke yesterday and could not roll off the burden which came upon me. The way in which you spoke did not leave the best impression upon the people. That night I was greatly burdened, and one of authority said to me, say to my servant, Alonzo Jones, that he is to stand as a representative man. He is to put on Christ Jesus and to be guarded in his attitude and words so that he shall not give others an excuse for being dictatorial and overbearing. The spirit of harshness, a desire to rule, must be put away from our ministers, our teachers, and the managers of our institutions. The meekness of Christ must be revealed. Right? So this is a counsel to everyone, right? Not just Jones. But Jones is being single, 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 signal, singled out because he is to stand as a representative man, right? He has been called to a certain work and he has to be more cautious because he's going to give others an excuse for being dictatorial and overbearing. Correct? 
Yes. Yeah, and it's not something that we should ever do. It, it, and it's 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 a difficult position to be in. The position that Jeff was in, for instance, it was difficult because people could turn almost anything into excuse for claiming that Jeff was dictatorial and overbearing. And Jeff gave in, in a sense, to this pressure by um, because of all these unjust criticisms uh, to actually believe and act upon unjust criticisms of others. So it was a mistake that he made. It was a weakness that he had. Now, Joan's weakness, Ellen White says, you have naturally a di dictatorial spirit. And it has increased in your efforts to eradicate the evils which have come in since the Minneapolis meeting. So this is what I was talking about before. Jones believed in this truth so much and wanted to see this work accomplished. But these evils that had come in since 1888, in trying to oppose them, this increased his naturally dictatorial spirit. She says, your great strength and power lies in linking up with Jesus Christ. That's where our power is, because Christ, and Jones taught this, right? Right? When you're going to fight against the world, what did he teach in the 1893 General Conference? Could you defeat the world? No, I can't defeat the world. Right. You're not going to defeat the enemy. You're not going to defeat the politics of the world. You're not going to defeat these governments, these powers, these principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. The only thing that you can do is trust in Christ and his methods, his ideas, his way of doing things in his power. But Jones didn't follow that counsel. He took it personally. And I understand why. Because he was being attacked personally. He saw these evils arising. And this took his natural dictatorial spirit, a part of his nature, and it caused this to increase. She says, John Corliss and yourself are men through whom God can work if you will let the knowledge of the truth be a burning and a shining light. However wrong the course of others, let no thrusts be made. No yokes laid upon the neck of anyone. You are to break every yoke. God calls upon you to be tender-hearted, pitiful, and courteous in presenting the blessed invitations of the gospel. Let every word be that which, under similar circumstances, would be spoken by the Savior. Now, of course, all of us have... Well, I, should, I, I shouldn't include everyone else. I know I have not acted always pitiful and courteous in how I've dealt with what I see to be evils, you know, especially in my opposition to conspiracy theories that I believe are destructive. I've sometimes taken it personally, right? I've spoken words I shouldn't have spoken. And, and Satan has used that so that those that are an enemy to the truth can look at my words and what I've said and they can discredit the work that God's given me to do in presenting the truth. And all of us have an opportunity to present the truth and have to be careful of our words. It is essential for you to soften and subdue your manner of address, else you will do harm. Do not exhibit your natural traits of character, but be clothed with humility. You have most powerful truth to present, and it will exert its influence in your life if your life testifies to your close relation to Christ. There's no use of putting harshness into the voice. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And then we have here the confession of A.T. Jones. 
He says, I feel myself so condemned before God that I repented and in contrition of spirit asked him to forgive me for every word I had spoken, which, though truth, it would have been better not to speak. And that's where I often fail. It's easy to say, I said the truth. Sometimes it's better not to speak. To trust that God is going to work things out, you know, presently in this movement with the division that exists is pretty difficult. So often we think that we know what should be done. But we need this, this patience. We need to have the spirit of Christ in how we deal with each other. So hopefully that was helpful. I mean, we're going to come back to the later part of Joan's history, as I said. But I thought we should look at that before we read the general the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. So this is what we're going to do next Friday. We'll start on this. And, and we'll start to see, and, and it's not that I want to pick out, you know, Joan's flaws here. But we'll start to see that some of the arguments that he's making or the things that he's presenting, He's presenting them because there is opposition. And, and I don't know if that was necessarily the right thing to do. That is, when somebody, when somebody is opposed to the truth, they've built up some fortifications, right? That is, they've built up a wall uh, to defend their position. And the one thing you don't want to do is to um, attack where their fortifications are, right? You want to find common ground, things that you, ways to reach a person where that person is open. And I, and I feel that in the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, that we see more of this than we see in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. That is, Jones is addressing certain points now in some ways he's doing a very good job so i mean I'm, i don't think i could have done a better job than him in presenting and dealing with this uh, controversy that was existing but he's already experiencing this opposition and he starts to push and and it's going to manifest itself more and more as time goes on but it's beginning here in 1895 at least so, so when we start reading through this next Friday, I'm going to point some of those things out, what the controversies are and why Jones is making the arguments that he is. And um, so hopefully that will be clear when we get there, when we go through these articles. A any final thoughts about this study and what we've, what we've looked at today? Not for me so far. I think this is you know very necessary for us to truly consider. Yeah. I mean, I just I mean, I spent a lot of years studying all of these documents, but I don't feel that I can even really do any justice to it. Um, you know, people need to study the original source documents themselves. I mean, Ellen White's 1888. Uh, materials, um, I think, are a must-read, though they can be a bit hard to get through. And and then there's the other materials too of all the other letters that other people wrote. But I think Ellen White's statements are are the best. Um, if anybody's going to read the 1888 materials, but there's a lot of information. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen in the church, and. The, the way the church has done, at least the side of the church that is opposed to Joan's message, I mean, they've, they've cherry-picked to paint a picture of the past. And George R. Knight is by far the one who's done the most uh, destructive work. But it really was started by, by Froome and A.G. Daniels. I remember when I was at... Uh, um, uh, Jonah's place there uh, back in 2000, I 
I guess it would be 2012. Um, I can't remember who had the book. I think there was somebody there and they have this book. And this was the book by um, A.G. Daniels on a righteousness by faith. I can't remember the title of the book, Christ or Righteousness or the Righteousness of Christ or something like that. I can't even remember who had the book. But they were sort of urging, you know, that this book was representative of the truth. And, um, but it isn't, right? I mean, it's truth mixed with error. The idea is that A.T. Jones actually did finally receive um, the message of righteousness by faith that Jones and Wagner presented. That's what he claims. And, and Froome claims the same thing, that, that this was received by Daniels when it was initially not. Um, <clears throat> but I see no evidence in the book that, that there's an understanding of Jones' message. So the fact that Jones was endorsed by his sister White, too, you know. What's what's that? Was, uh, Jones was endorsed by Sister White also. Yeah. But the thing is, the church has claimed that they have accepted Jones' message, right? Um, though they talk out of both sides of their mouth at the same time. They talk about how Jones had all these character defects and, and that he went to extremes, right, because he did later on. Um, but they use that as a way of discrediting his message. George R. Knight, is, I, I think he might be the one who created the term last generation theology. Um, but I read some other of his history books on Adventism. And, uh, you know, he completely misrepresents what, what um, uh, <clears throat> um, mess who wrote the book Messages to the Churches, um, Andreasen, M.L. Andreasen, taught. So he, he says that Jones and Andreasen, um, they're, they're the ones teaching this last generation theology. I don't know if he calls it that in that book or not, but um, this sort of perfectionism. And, uh, of course, M. L. Andreasen was the one who was opposed to the conferences uh, in, what, wherever it was, 55, 56, 57, I guess 56, that produced the book Questions on Doctrine. Um, and, and he wrote letters to the churches telling them about what was happening with the uh, evangelical conferences. So, um, But the churches maintain that we, we still teach righteousness by faith as endorsed by Ellen White, but we just don't uh, endorse the extreme. We don't support the extremes. And, and so they would look at last generation theology as an extreme, what they call last generation theology. But I know when I first became an Adventist, they, they didn't have that label, uh, but they would just kind of mock saying, so you're going to be a bunch of little perfect Christs walking around. It's going to be 144,000 perfect Christs, you know. Uh, this was said to me by a pastor. So, so, you know, it's something that we have to not just debate, but actually experience. And, and that was the thing that Jones could not do. He could not practice what he preached when it came to, you know, push coming to shove. Right. Okay. So thanks for that, everyone. Let's uh, close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this evening. Thank you for the Sabbath. And we pray that you can bless each person. Um, we pray that we can know your presence and that we can unite um, with one another but even those that, um, that rub us the wrong way, that have opposed us, that have said things to us that have hurt us, we ask, Lord, that we can forgive them and that we can see um, an opportunity to minister to those uh, with whom we differ. Help us to be a part of this ministry of reconciliation, bringing people uh, to Christ so that we can be reconciled to one another. Be with us now. May your angels watch over us and bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.